did just um, email. This meeting is being recorded. Oops, we're being recorded. Got it. Um, Sorry, I forgot to hit start. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, that was just the preamble. Um, I just emailed you um, the PowerPoint, so hopefully you can open that and we can um, bring up your screen. So go ahead and check. It's just coming from yeah. my um, Gmail address. My work account did not want to um, cooperate with that. All right. So okay. the, the as, soon as, as, soon, as soon as it shows up, I'll pop it up. Cool. Thank you, Sean. Um, so the, the way that the talk is going to break down, um, we're going to go over some approaches to building and designing a barrel program. Um, to barrel selection and acquisition, um, some fundamentals of barrel handling, maintenance, sanitation, you know, not in um, extraordinary detail, but I'm certainly happy to have that conversation with anyone um, at the end of this talk, or if you want to be in touch by email or in any other matter, I'm certainly open to that. Um, and other aspects of completing your barrel aging toolkit. So some of the hardware um, and other types of equipment that you might want to bring in to sort of take things from a real rudimentary level to um, a bit more sophistication. Um, then we'll get into some um, developing and managing the program a little bit more from um, a data and kind of logistical standpoint, um, how you're record keeping for your barrel seller, um, how you're conducting sensory evaluation and reporting that data, and how you're training brewery staff in different aspects of um, brewing um, barrel aging procedures. And then finally, we'll get a little bit into what I've, um, what I've sort of subtitled maximizing your barrel seller halo effect. Um, we all know that, you know, these beers, for most of us who produce them are labors of love, are lost leaders, right, in sort of, you know, sales or marketing speak. Um, but how can you kind of maybe get some more out of that, like really make it work for you um, and find ways to get a little bit more volume out, um, maybe in front of different um, customers and clientele who, who you wouldn't necessarily encounter perhaps in your own tap room or um, you know, in your immediate community where your brewery is located. So, and I am kind of going off the slides here. So I, I'm, I'm looking at, I've, I've got a little bit of an overview of some of the recent awards that um, we did rack up at MotorWorks um, coming out of that cellar while I was there. Um, I'm really proud um, of the fact that um, we got a couple of awards at this most recent uh, Brewers Ball, uh, Best Florida Beer Awards. Um, I saw that we took home um, a gold in wood and barrel aged strong beer for our Pedro Jimenez Sherry aged Belgian quad, um, a silver for our tequila barrel aged Adel Porter. Um, so we, we've had some nice successes over the years and I'm really um, confident that our team at MotorWorks is gonna kind of keep all that rolling, you know, as we, as we go forward, as they go forward, right? I don't get to say we anymore. Um, but, uh, really happy to see that. And, um, all right. So we'll kind of get into the, um, outline of designing a barrel aging program, right? Um, what it takes to plan and design recipes that are particular to barrel aging, um, to master the fundamentals of clean aging and kind of moving into some different farmhouse, sour, wild styles. Um, acquiring barrels strategically and intentionally, evaluating barrels, handling them, um, and maintaining them, and then also determining aging timelines and recruiting schedules um, and release schedules as well. So when you're coming to recipe design for your barrel aged beers, um, you should really be thinking about what aspects of a certain style that you know is going to end up in a barrel um, that you might want to emphasize um, when you compose the recipe. Um, sometimes my um, former boss, Bob Hay, head brewer at MotorWorks, he would look at some of these barrel aged recipes and be like, that looks like a home brew recipe because you're just layering like a lot of different malts in there. But, you know, I really made a point of sort of going for a lot of the middle range using different blends of uh, caramel crystal and roasted malts um, you know, for specific styles, um, you know, thinking of more of your kind of, you know, mid-range amber to brown to darker beers, um, but also, you know, then certainly for some lighter styles kind of getting out of the way in terms of perhaps, you know, you want to minimize hop characteristics and really, um, you know, drive things more towards culture development or showing off the characteristics of a specific type of barrel. So that's not to say that you deviate from 
what we might consider to be um, standard um, specs for a given style and its recipe. But it's certainly worth thinking if you're brewing something that you know is going to end up in a barrel, um, the way that you might like to show off the characteristics of that style and or the characteristics of that barrel, right? Like, are you working uh, to complement the barrel? Are you working to develop some kind of contrast? Um, and then on top of that, um, what might emerge over time, right? Like how is the aged beer, the finished beer going to vary from um, what may be a younger or strictly like stainless fermented, clean fermented version of this beer is gonna taste like. So I'll throw a couple of examples out there. Um, one that we rolled out real recently was um, a relatively high ABV beer to guard that um, we had put together for Burns Steakhouse. Um, this is a collab, I'll, I'll, I'll talk um, a bit more about our partnership with them closer to the end of the talk. Um, but basically they had provided us with a series of these really wonderful um, Eagle Rare bourbon barrels and um, had five barrels, inspected them all, you know, the fairly consistent quality and really wanted to put together a beer that was going to display like a high quality bourbon. Um, we're all like super familiar with bourbon barrel stouts and that sort of thing, porters as a go-to. There's a reason that those beers are a classic style. Um, but I also, you know, for the Burns audience, Burns being, um, I'm sure you're all more or less familiar with them, but really a world-class wine and spirits destination. Um, a, a beer that would stand up to um, the demands of the barrel, but also really display it effectively. I, I thought of it as a bourbon drinker's beer. So not something that's going to be overly um, chocolatey or perhaps, um, you know, dark roasted malts, um, moderate on the body, although relatively high in um, alcohol. I want it to be spirit-like. So I would say that, you know, for a beer to guard, it really ended up on the, the high gravity, high ABV end of the spectrum. Um, and that turned out to be something like an 11% alcohol beer. Um, you know, with a beer to guard yeast that while it slots into that farmhouse family is not going to produce the types of acids and funk that we might associate with say, you know, a mixed culture Saison. There's a relationship there, but this is going to be cleaner. It's going to produce acid, but not on that level um, and really kind of allow the barrel characteristics to display themselves. Um, in conjunction with um, the malt. I'm a, I'm a big fan of throwing um, like extra special and special B and some of that stuff into these barrel projects um, along with other biscuit, aromatic, um, some darker Munichs as well. Um, and that one really came out as like kind of a wonderful amber to copper colored um, high ABV, fairly boozy, but not overly harsh um, beer to guard that at six months we were able to pull and um, do a blend of three of those initial five barrels, let the others ride. And then I kind of left, you know, as I was leaving the brewery, left the, the recipe and kind of the timeline for aging with my team with the intent that those barrels could then be filled and reblended in sort of a semi Solera method type of production. Um, and so what we were able to do was, you know, at six months, assess all five of the barrels. In addition, we also had a separate um, WL Weller cask that was going, um, that would be sort of a standalone single select, but assess the, the five um, Eagle Rare barrels, pull the ones that made the sort of most harmonious, you know, um, um, blend for that initial release and then allow the others to take on, you know, additional character, smooth out some of the rougher edges, and then potentially be, um, you know, a, a blending match for some of the younger beer that would follow in, you know, three to six months beyond that. Um, so, you know, that was one approach to um, the beer to guard, a really sort of unexpected um, match that worked out a, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, to, a red rye IPA um, aged in a Sagamore spirit rye whiskey.
epic rhyme. This was for um, um, and As, um, as kind of a request, They're like we want to do any favors. Well, what characteristic and the residual bitterness. Hey, hey, Mike. If you can pause for a minute, um, I, yeah. I'm not. Sure. I think you've. Absolutely. I think you've got some uh, some lag going on there because I think we you were cutting out for a bunch of us. I thought it was just me, but it looks like it's a couple of people. My back. Hello. I can hear you now. Yeah, there you are. You can hear me. Now? Okay. Not sure what's going on. There. Okay. Um, yeah, you're, still, you're still you're still kind of you're still kind of choppy at the Excellent. moment. Okay, let me see if I can um, sort of reset my Wi-Fi for a second. Here. Okay, we'll be here. And while I have you people here, <laughs> I'm going to use this moment to uh, remind you that our. Uh, um, our legislative efforts are continuing uh, in in Tallahassee. Um, we uh, we actually had a I don't know if you saw we had a um, a uh, a small victory uh, earlier this week with our house, okay. with uh, with our house bill uh, for the um, uh, brand registration uh, moving moving forward through committee. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be put uh, the top priority list for its uh, for its next committee. So that's going to be a a, a a big deal uh, and a good thing. And it looks like we have a lot of support. There's a lot of things going on. So I encourage you to read the letter that that went out, um, as well as the post on the forums, because um, uh, th things are looking uh, like we're we're getting somewhere. So. Okay. Sure. Um, I'm back. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Uh, give us Sorry. give us a couple seconds of, of talking to see if you're if you're going to be consistent there. Okay. Um, yeah. I just reset my Wi-Fi, so hopefully it will now be consistent. I'm getting a good feed of you over here. Okay. Um, were you able to yeah. um, see my PowerPoint in your email? Uh, no, it has not come through. Okay, that is odd. All right. Um, okay, well, if you can hear me talking smoothly, I will um, continue that. Yes, yeah, I, th I think you're good now. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, was discussing the, the epic ride. Were you guys able to hear um, a little bit of what I was saying about that particular beer? Sean? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, if, I mean, if, if you could back up maybe to the beginning of the Epic Rye section. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so as I said, that, that, was, um, that was a combination of a, a rye IPA, which again, an IPA for aging was something that I didn't have familiarity with before. Um, going into a rye barrel, and to me sort of the idea of rye on rye seemed, um, I don't know, a little counterproductive um, you know, usually I'd be going for something that maybe has more contrast, um, but it really did work well. Um, the, the rye character came out pretty nice. This, the spirit barrel itself, which was a Sagamore spirit rye, um, was relatively high character. So we got a nice kind of, you know, spicy pop off of that. Um, but the fact that the hop character still held up reasonably well, we used, you know, high alpha Pacific Northwest, Chinook, um, Perhaps some citra got in there. Um, 
trying to think back a couple of years ago, what, what else we, we might have thrown into that. Um, possibly even Amarillo um, back a few years ago. And um, the, the bitterness and a lot of the earthy and resinous tones really, really held up nicely on that beer. Um, but it developed more in the direction of kind of um, an English cask ale, you know, sort of a, an English um, IPA, to be honest. Um, that was a real surprise. I would encourage people to experiment a little bit with um, aging some hoppier beers once you've kind of got, you know, the fundamentals down for yourself. So that, that was kind of a nice education for me. Um, other ways that we've kind of approached it, um, we had a lot of nice success aging our um, Thresher barley wine in bourbon barrels. Um, we brought that along to um, do a barrel blend where we actually had one, we had an old Forester bourbon and we had a Chardonnay barrel that had previously held a mixed culture Saison. Um, I had actually let the culture in that Chardonnay barrel um, uh, languish for a while. It had been sitting for a couple of months um, since it had been emptied, but there was still slurry. It, it still seemed viable. Um, and we ended up putting a barley wine on um, Saison dregs in a Chardonnay barrel and blending that with um, a more straightforward bourbon uh, version of the same beer. Um, that beer ended up winning um, best um, of the Southeast at the US Beer Tasting Championships a couple of years ago. Um, it was really kind of a nice, surprising success. So that was one where um, we had an existing recipe that we knew was um, you know, designed for barrel aging and giving us certain characteristics and just put it in kind of a new context um, not knowing initially whether that was going to be two separate beers or whether it was a blend. And again, doing sensory evaluation, um, going through the process with that one and um, being willing to experiment. And it really kind of turned out to be um, an outstanding example. And then just sort of one final um, example of, um, you know, kind of coming up with different types of designs for barrel aging. Um, we uh, just recently, right before I left Motorworks, brought um, an Oud Brune out of, um, out of white wine casks. And that was one that um, I had really designed for sort of a long-term aging uh, project. Um, you know, looking at a beer like that, that's one where I really wanted to both accentuate the wine-like notes and develop acidity that's perhaps a little bit higher than um, your average Oud Brune. If you're not super familiar with the style, you know, think of it as a darker, less sour, um, you know, Flanders red type of deal. Um, and really wanted to give um, the mixed culture a chance to go through different forms of like malolactic um, fermentation, produce different acids so that it would have a lot of complexity over a longer timeline. You know, we're talking like two plus years of aging um, while never developing so much acidity or so much alcohol for that matter. It was only like a five or 6% beer um, that it would be this overwhelming big beer. I really wanted it to be something that was sort of smaller, more refined. Um, I'm always about kind of showing off like the bready kind of mid range of some of these aged beers um, rather than just going for like a really dark roasty note or a really intense, um, you know, sourness to it. So it was really about kind of bringing, um, bringing in a more moderated, less kind of common style to it. Um, and we did bring that, that out initially. Um, I believe it's sitting in kegs and I know I've got a couple cases of, of bottles, but we're also sort of letting that now um, condition even further in packaging, which the beer is designed to do. Um, to continue to smooth out the, the rough notes. So, you know, different approaches, different timelines. Some of these beers, you know, are gonna get there in three to six months, not usually less than that, um, unless you're doing some sort of additional treatment. Um, but you can also start thinking about the longer timeline, you know, of beers that would traditionally require 18 to 24 months or even beyond. And I've got a couple other examples of like the beyond, um, you know, that, that we'll get to here. Um, so barrel selection and assessment, right? Um, if you're kind of starting out a barrel aging program, um, it's best to um, 
you know, acquire some fresh, um, you know, X spirit barrels that have been used one time, ideally, you know, if you can acquire barrels that are still wet, that's the way to go. There's lots of reputable providers out there. You've got um, Barrels Direct, which slash River Drive Cooperage up in Maine. Um, we've ordered a bunch from there. Um, you can do um, Rocky Mountain Cooperage, um, Rocky Mountain Barrel Company. Um, and um, the Barrel Mill um, out in Minnesota, they're good too. Um, you know, you're gonna look at anywhere from probably 100 to 250 for like kind of a standard 53 gallon spirit cask. Um, if you get into larger format barrels, um, which we have, you know, talking about like 66 gallon, um, um, perhaps sherry, other different types of wines, um, you know, you might be looking upwards of $500 for some of those casks. So depending on what your budget is for sort of assembling barrels, um, this is a very direct way to get high quality barrels and sort of pick out what you want. But I think that we all kind of know that what does also happen is that um, sometimes we're gifted barrels, sometimes um, they'll appear, um, you know, on social media, you've got someone who's like, oh, we're, you know, giving stuff away or we need to empty out the cellar. And certainly people will acquire them that way. Um, and at MotorWorks, we also had the fortune of, um, you know, having partners who would reach out to us and be like, look, we've got certain specific barrels that we want filled for a given project. Um, you know, can you do something with them? And, um, you know, that's always a nice option too. So the bottom line is sometimes, you know, you get to choose things um, your own way and sometimes you happen upon barrels and, um, you know, you work with kind of what you receive. Um, when you are, um, selecting barrels, if you have the fortune to go and do it in person, um, you, you really should kind of get in there and have a little checklist in mind of what you're looking for. First of all, you know, select for the spirit type and the intensity of character that you're looking for. Um, you know, if you're a, um, you know, a, a, let's say a, an Eagle Rare drinker and you know the profile of that spirit, um, if you're going to pick up an Eagle Rare barrel, like get your, get your face in there, get your nose in there, um, check out the aroma and it should say Eagle Rare to you, like in some sort of a specific way, ideally, if you're really familiar with that product. Um, certainly, you know, looking for intensity, ideally, if there's wet spirit still in there, that's how you know that, you know, more or less, you're going to have a totally clean watertight barrel. Um, so that's crucial. If it's dry though, you can certainly work with it. Um, older barrels will develop some nice character um, in time. You're not gonna get like a three month turnaround on those, but you could certainly um, you know, put um, a porter into a, a dry bourbon barrel and get something in six to nine months that you know, could be considered quite high quality, um, depending on how, how you handle that. Um, beyond just character and aroma though, you know, you should really be looking at um, barrel integrity, um, cleanliness. Get, I always get in with a flashlight and look real close. Um, in terms of cleanliness, you know, you're looking for any kind of evidence of microbial growth that could be showing up in those barrels. Um, you know, white kind of fuzzy, like penicillin type mold doesn't really put me off. That's not that big of a deal. Even some of the kind of gentler looking green stuff. But if you start to see anything that, you know, is verging on darker colored mold, obviously you wanna really, really stay away from that. Um, you should also be looking at the integrity um, of the heads and staves. Um, heads in particular, you'll see a lot of warping. Um, that can be a formula for um, leakage down the road. Um, staves, if you're seeing unevenness, if you're seeing um, a lot of damage to the bands, that could be a warning side. Also, always look and see if the bands have been nailed. If, if someone has attempted to nail the, the barrel bands in place, that means that they probably were just trying to use it for furniture at some point, and I would probably consider that a no-go. Not that I haven't had um, like received barrels in different situations that um, had been nailed, uh, had the bands nailed down, but it's just not something that sort of indicates that this is like a barrel that's got a lot of life 
left. So I, I would consider that to be a, a mild warning sign, um, not a deal breaker, but um, certainly something that um, you know I always inspect for very closely now. And if you don't know what I mean, I'm talking about the, the little nails that have like a 90 degree head to them that are basically just used to like hold the bands up like either towards the center of the bilge, right? Or quite commonly, if someone was trying to use the thing as a table and the hoops kept falling off, they'll use it to support the bands. And that's kind of, you know, once something has shifted into furniture mode, it's usually not something that I'm gonna wanna take on um, as a barrel for, for aging beer. Um, again, looking for un unevenness, warping in the, the head, um, obviously anything like a visible gap would, would be a real problem too. So um, my other big tip is that when you're acquiring barrels, whether you're getting fresh use barrels, you're getting them from you know, um, a partner or some other source, or you're simply going out and sort of collecting them in the field, um, consider getting them in pairs or sets. Um, that's going to give you options once you get beer in there to blend or to select. Um, just because often you don't know, you know what you're gonna get, you're gonna get different levels of progression, especially with some of those older and drier barrels. All right. Um, basic maintenance and coopering. Um, as I said, wet, use, uh, wet first use barrels are going to give you the least amount of headaches. Um, they're already showing you evidence that they're watertight, so that's nice. Um, you're going to want to, whether you know, for treating those barrels after their use or if you've acquired some older barrels, you're, you're gonna want to get the essential tools that you need um, for some basic coopering and upkeep. So um, a, a mallet sledgehammer, like a steel headed uh, sledge and a hoop driver. Um, you can use some sort of chisel or perhaps screwdriver, but something that's got a thin wide face that's gonna allow you to line up along the edges of um, the bands and also perhaps to um, work on some of the gaps um, between staves and your um, head sections as well. Um, some kind of um, wood um, flocking or stripping, basically um, you can buy um, flocking cones that you can cut strips off of. I would simply take um, a, a knife and slice off thin bands and try to insert them into gaps where barrels were showing, um, you know, pretty clear leaking that wasn't going to easily um, be corrected by swelling the barrel. And you can actually take your um, hoop driver or your chisel and work it very carefully um, into those gaps with your hammer and kind of lay strips, um, you know, one upon another. And that should eventually swell and plug your barrel. I know there are a lot of people who like to use um, whether it might be wax or like a food grade type of paint or sealant on barrels. Um, I haven't been as much of a practitioner of that over the years, um, strictly because it usually to be effective, I find you need to let the barrel dry out first and then go back to it. So it sort of, you know, elongates your timeline. Um, but it also makes it then more difficult if you're not doing it while you're in the process of hydrating or swelling a barrel, you don't necessarily see the leak. And so it's a little bit more of, um, to me, a scattershot approach to it. I like to get the, the barrel um, fully hydrated and swollen um, with filtered water, ideally ambient. Um, I, I know a lot of people talk about hot water and steaming, but what that does is it gives you a little bit of an exaggerated impression of how um, much the barrel can be swollen. Um, so I, I actually do like to, to hydrate with ambient filtered water. Um, and then if there are leaks that can be handled in that way with a little bit of um, wooden stripping and a delicate touch with um, a hoop driver and a hammer, um, that's generally how I go about um, trying to correct leaks on older barrels. Um, I also will do, obviously you're tightening the bands inwards and occasionally, you know, selective tapping on the ends of staves around the heads um, because you will typically see more leaks out around um, the, the seaming at the head of the barrel. Um, a CIP sprayer or steamer of some type. So um, similar to a CIP ball that you would have in a tank, um, you can simply have one that's on a rod. You could even convert one out of a 
out of a CIP ball that's been removed from a tank. That's what I initially did. And then we bought um, a, a wand. So basically a long stainless pipe with a 90 degree angle and a CIP ball on the end. And um, I put high pressure um, HLT water right through that and spray out the inside of barrels. Um, an option for a lot of people would be getting some kind of a steam wand that's simply going to um, you know, give you straight steam rather than hot water. Um, I understand the appeal of that. You can get even higher temperatures than um, your HLT, but um, I've found that using water in the past has been pretty effective, um, especially if I'm trying to do some kind of um, combination, hydration and cleaning, um, rather than simply um, sterilizing the inside of the barrel. Um, I'm not necessarily a big believer that the that a barrel, especially a mixed culture barrel, can be sterilized, and a lot of them I wouldn't want them to be. Um, as I'll talk about in a second, I'm a big proponent of kind of leaving dregs and slurry in the barrel if possible. So um, the the hot CIP rinse is really something that um, you know I'll bring into effect when um, a dry barrel is showing some evidence of unwanted. Um, fuzz, you know, some kind of um, microbial growth, something I can live with, but that I want to remove um, um, versus something that would cause me to discard the barrel. And um, also using that perhaps as a hydration tool, um, you know, whether with hot or ambient water. Um, you'll also want obviously a bulldog that's a transfer tube um, that's going to be pressure driven. Um, a wine thief, um, you know, basically your straw for extracting um, samples from the bung of the barrel. Um, or, you know, we're, we're all pretty familiar with um, the, the concept of the, the Vinny nail at this point, the Vinny Solerzo method of um, putting a, um, like a 304 stainless nail into one of your head staves. Um, you could take a drill bit at, um, uh, what was I using? Maybe a 1 16th or 1 8th um, drill bit, um, putting that in with like a quarter inch um, head nail. And, um, you know, that's a really easy sample port too, especially if you're um, stacking barrels, if you've got a lot of barrel racks, um, it's easier to sample right off the face of the barrel rather than trying to maneuver to get that um, wine thief in, right? So that's a nice option for that. I will also say, um, Purging out the headspace um, before and after sampling, generally a, a, a good practice. I know not everyone um, adheres to that, but um, I've certainly been a fan um, of, of doing that. I would keep um, a small CO2 bottle. If you have a regulator handy, that's good too. And simply lay down a light purge, um, open up the bung, lay down a light purge um, over the, the surface of the liquid um, while pulling samples um, off of the, the nail sample port. Um, once you've got, um, that basic hardware too, I also recommend, and this is what we did at MotorWorks, um, developing a whole, um, separate, um, set of barrel aging parts. Um, we had hardware, you know, clamps, gaskets, pumps, product lines, water lines, gas lines, um, gas barbs that lived in the cellar and that were apart from the, um, you know, the general population of parts in our brewery. Um, we did a good amount of mixed culture um, aging. And so that was a big reason for that. But uh, even on your quote unquote clean side, there's the possibility to develop different kinds of microbes that you might wanna keep away from your clean fermentation in stainless in the brewery. And um, so I would really recommend um, having a system for keeping those parts on their own. Um, I sort of went to lengths to label buckets and other containers where, whether parts were being cleaned and sanitized, collected after use, whatever, they could really be clearly marked so that brewery employees wouldn't confuse um, barrels, barrel, barrel cellar parts with um, other parts that they might want to use for packaging or any other procedure that was happening. Um, cellar climate control. Um, we, um, in my new place here, um, some of you may have caught this at the beginning of the talk at Firehouse, the brewery that I'm in now, it's, um, uh, a building that was used as a winery previously, um, before they brought in the brew house. 
Um, so there's a, an expansive climate controlled cellar down below me. It's um, here in South Dakota, we have a really different issue than what we might have in Florida where the um, heat and humidity got really high during the summer. Well, here the humidity is extremely low. It's a arid climate. Um, and so there's actually um, a built in, like a very light mister, misting sprayer system, um, stainless piping above the um, barrel storage area here that helps to maintain um, humidity. And so you're looking for ideally, um, you know, 73 to 85% relative humidity in your barrel aging space, depending on temperature, that kind of goes down a little bit as your temperature goes down. Um, but as a general rule, not below 66% um, relative humidity, if, if you can manage it. Um, in the MotorWorks cellar, we had um, an AC, um, system that was piping in air that was um, occasionally drying things out. Sometimes it would get, you know, below that number into the fifties in the winter. Um, sometimes I would bring in a small humidifier to, to try to maintain that. But I'm also a believer in letting, um, you know, the natural kind of cycle of the year ebb and flow. And, um, you know, that, that's a, a highly traditional approach, just letting the kind of seasonal variation in temperature and humidity um, expand and contract and actually open up the barrel um, in different ways that will allow um, some more variation um, in, in your aging. Um, a couple things about um, empty barrel handling and, and sanitation. Um, there's a little bit of a, a difference of opinion out there about storing barrels full versus empty. Um, some brewers have brought over um, storage procedures from the winemaking industry um, involving um, potassium metabisulfite and citric acid solutions. So like a low pH sulfur liquid um, in, a, in an empty barrel for long-term storage. Um, I've seen this done in different concentrations, anywhere from um, two grams potassium metabisulfite and one gram citric acid to the liter of water to those same amounts for um, an entire 53 to 59 gallon cask. Um, the debate seems to be over whether um, the higher concentrations effectiveness is worth the trade-off in potential sulfur um, infusion into your wood. For me, it's not. Um, I tried some lower concentrate solution after a couple months it definitely grew some long strands um of um you know unwanted fungal you know penicillin um went through a few rounds of experimentation with that and um found i wasn't really happy with it potassium metabisulfite is also kind of a nasty um uh compound to have to work with it really gasses off um unpleasantly you'll kind of choke on it so um if people want to try that for longer term barrel solutions, um, you know, I would say experiment, see if you can find um, a ratio that works. I, I'd recommend checking out the, the lines on it um, and some of the links on the Milk the Funk wiki. Um, if you're not already familiar with milkthefunk.com, um, they um, have a brewer's wiki about sort of all things um, wild and mixed fermentation. Um, and barrel aging, so definitely a, a good resource. Um, beyond the, the sulfur citric solution, you'll also see some discussion of burning sulfur discs or sticks in um, empty barrels. Um, this poses an explosion hazard as you could ignite um, the spirits in there. So I, I, would, I would probably caution that I, I haven't actually tried that myself. What I've found the most success with is simply um, sealing barrels immediately after emptying and um, then periodically checking on them to see how long they hold liquid. Um, my preference is always to refill a beer back onto those dregs or slurry, um, whether it's a similar recipe or something radically different where I'm just looking to pick up a little bit of additional character. Um, I don't think that you should be at all afraid of, you know, having some residual slurry in there when you're, you're filling a new barrel. And in fact, the, um, both the, the alcohol, but also the, the moisture from that will help keep the barrel in a swollen state 
um, even when you're storing it um, empty, but it's still got a little bit of liquid in there. Um, the alternative, you know, if it dries out or goes bad, you can always do like a hard CIP or steam rinse on it. Um, you know, loosen up those dried out dregs and, um, you know, dump them out if you really do want to clean that barrel out um, at the time that you're going to refill it. All right, kind of moving on here. Um, a few notes just about expanding the flavor toolkit. Um, I did want to mention for people who um, are trying different treatments, some of the products out there like wood spirals and cubes, um, different kind of alternative solutions for getting wood flavor profiles into your beer. Um, we've had some nice results using wood spirals to make spirit extracts or tinctures for beers in stainless. Um, I haven't attempted to reinfuse character into a barrel um, through the use of spirals in any way, but certainly for, um, for stainless, um, even bright tanks, um, you can go ahead and try out some of those different wood profiles. And it opens up a few different avenues to you. First of all, you know, you're gonna get flavor quickly. It's not gonna be the same as developing flavor over a long period of time where you're gonna have you know, oxidation and real kind of chemical exchange and transformation between um, the barrel and the beer, but it will get wood character into your beer real quick. Um, and it allows you to perhaps play around with those flavor profiles on some different styles or lower ABV beers um, than you might otherwise um, be able to. So for instance, uh, for an event, we did a, um, we did a tequila barrel, tequila barrel, you know, uh, lime light lager, um, where we had treated it with some lime oil. This was a, a beer that we were doing, you know, regularly already and um, did an extraction on um, a blend of different charred um, American oak spirals um, with the tequila and allowed it to extract out some wood flavor and then throw that, you know, combined um, extract liquid directly into the bright tank. And it did a pretty good impression of, you know, tequila barrel. Um, not with the level of complexity, but it gets you a different flavor profile for a beer that was only about 3.5% ABV um, and certainly wasn't going to be something that would hold up to like longer term aging. So that was kind of a fun way to play around. Um, other things that I would um, suggest for trying in barrels, um, nut flowers can be really great, but try doing some whole or like crushed walnuts, pecans, things like that you tend not to get great extraction out of those types of products. Flour is really, and you can buy it commercially. Um, you can get walnut, pecan, almond, hazelnut, pistachio, flour, um, and go directly into the barrel. And that's gonna give you a huge zap of, um, of flavor. Um, coffee, probably ground, um, although that's gonna impart a lot of color. Um, chili peppers, um, we had a really nice success um, putting whole chilies into, um, a rum barrel with an imperial pastry stout in it. Simply selected some really hot chilies, sliced them in half, um, put them in a, a small, um, like a mini hot bag, dunked it in and allowed about five days of extraction there. Um, and it was really, really effective. I find if you go more than a week putting hot chilies into barrel aging beer, the oak starts to draw it all in. And what you'll get is some um, some nice capsaicin that's in reserve for the next liquid that goes in, but it'll draw it, it'll draw it out of the, uh, out of the beer in a few weeks. Um, and of course, whole fruit, you know, whether um, you're doing clean fermentation or souring, um, our practice was always to um, gently pasteurize fruit. We did blueberries, um, uh, peaches, cherries, um, pasteurizing at 145 degrees for 30 minutes, um, allowing that to kind of semi-liquefy the fruit and then loading it um, with a, a sanitized funnel directly into the bung. Um, I'd recommend also acquiring some sort of um, stainless prod or poker to kind of get the fruit down into the barrel. But um, I know that a lot of people have um, interest and success um, adding fruit to barrels. so. I'd say, you know, err on the side of keeping it clean. Pasteurization is always a good idea. Um, and, uh, you know, something 
that's sanitized to help you get it into that barrel with a minimal amount of mess. You might also want to really account for head space. Um, just um, when you're loading, let's call it, you know, 10 to 20 pounds of fruit um, into a single barrel um, does take up a couple gallons of space. Um, so yeah, those are, those are a few ideas about, you know, introducing different flavors, different fermentables um, into barrels. I can certainly, you know, field questions from people um, after the fact, but um, wanted to kind of move along to um, the idea of developing and managing a barrel program, right? Um, really kind of making it something that has structure, um, that has planning to it. Um, so this means managing your record keeping, um, recording sensory data and um, other types of evaluations that you make on your beers, um, educating your brewery staff um, on practices that are specific to the barrel seller and um, introducing new equipment to your team um, that allows them to sort of advance and progress into different areas of the brewery. Um, so when it comes to recording barrel data, come up with a consistent numerical system for tracking your barrels. Um, I know that this seems obvious, but to me, just saying barrel one, barrel two, barrel three um, is not detailed or comprehensive enough um, to fit into like a more sophisticated system. So for instance, I based our barrel system off of the way that we were numbering tanks at MotorWorks. Um, tanks would be given a number based on their volume and then their number within that set. So for instance, if we had, you know, a 30 barrel fermenter, we'd have barrel, uh, we'd have tank 301, 302, 303, indicating 30 barrels, number one, two, three, and so on. Um, I did something similar with our barrels um, but I split them into two groups, um, clean and dirty. So our A side of the cellar was clean fermentation. B side was um, mixed culture, sour barrels. Um, and then we had a lot of different barrel formats. Um, so I would assign um, a barrel number based on volume and then a number after that. So for instance, a clean um, 30 barrel cask might be A3001. Um, a 53-gallon uh, spirit barrel, and that's kind of your, your standard, your go-to size, would be A5302, and so on and so forth. Then on the other side, it would be like B59 for a 59-gallon um, wine cask, 01, 02, 03, 04. B66, 01, 02, 03, 04. And so that allowed me to really kind of categorize once you start to acquire more barrels, especially if you have any kind of um, brewery software, it really allows you to sort of, you know, review your inventory a little bit more easily and get more information out of your record keeping. Um, in addition to that, once you've sort of got your organizational system down, um, I would urge you to keep clear records of barrel type, size, obviously, contents over time, the history of the barrel, um, filling and emptying dates, and the overall condition and quality of the barrel, as in, is this barrel still putting out good beer, A? Is this barrel still holding liquid effectively, B? Um, and, you know, sometimes those things did not go hand in hand. Um, I had a set of tequila barrels that were a real pain to hydrate and to get to hold um, liquid and be watertight, but they put out good beers year after year. And um, I would continue to do the coopering. I'd give them like kind of an A, A minus for um, character and like a C plus to a C minus depending on the barrel um, for integrity. Um, and sort of once they dropped below a certain level, you know, with integrity, um, then they'd, they'd be retired. But really, you know, have kept some barrels in the loop for longer because I knew they continued to just reliably produce great beers. Um, if you've got brewery software um, or any other kind of um, inventory system that you're using um, to track inventory and your TTB data, um, make sure that you're keeping accurate estimates of your volumes. Um, don't let your barrel seller just be somewhere where volume kind of, you know, goes off the map. Um, try to come up with accurate estimates of the volumes that you're moving into your barrels um, that's gonna be reflected when you move them back into brights so that your, your record keeping for your seller is effectively a holding area 
um, rather than just sort of, um, you know, something that disappears and reappears. Um, in our experience with MotorWorks, we started out with, um, you know, having very little record keeping when it came to accounting for um, barrel aged beers and ultimately incorporating a brewery management software. software we had Beer 30 um, and paying a little extra for the barrel aging module on that. The, that allowed us to really account for um, those volumes and ages of beer and to maintain our batch numbers throughout. So no, um, you know, brew dates and batch numbers were, were lost in the move from fermenter to barrel to break tank. Um, record thorough and specific sensory notes um, at regular intervals throughout the aging process. Develop a timeline for when you think certain styles should be ready to roll out. Um, and um, make sure that you've got recommendations to hold, blend, dump occasionally um, every time that you're recording sensory data for the beer. So really take time with it, you know, assess it for clarity, aroma, flavor, body, just like you would any of your other beers. And ideally, if you've got sets of um, barrels for a given batch, um, compare them, consider the blends that you might come up with from one barrel to the other. And whether simply kind of eyeballing it and pouring sample glasses, which I've done, or attempting to use maybe more precise measurement, try to come up with actual um, blends of those beers that might reflect different ratios, whether of barrel volumes or simply certain amounts that you might want to blend from one barrel to another um, when you're moving it into a bright tank for packaging. So there's, there's a lot of different methods there. It's easy to you know, lose track of this information if you don't have a record system. Before we went, we went to software, I actually um, had a series of small clipboards where I designate um, you know, a small clipboard with a pad for every single barrel and you know, would routinely kind of go through, update those notes and record them. But you know, do what makes sense for you. If you've got a smaller system, um, you can also do kind of a whiteboard um, recording uh, system if, you, if you've got enough room on there. So um, it really kind of depends on how large and quickly you're, you're growing that barrel program. Um, particular to sensory assessment for um, barrel aged beers. Um, when you're doing assessment, you know, if you are the primary person in your brewery who is looking after these beers, who's seeing them as they come along, that's great, but you still need to have other people who can, um, you know, affirm your sensory perception of beer um, and help you come to an agreement on blends and on readiness for different beers. Um, so as you kind of get deeper into the barrel aging process, you know, consider what aroma and flavor profiles exist for barrel aged beers that require a little bit different vocabulary perhaps than, um, you know, some of your clean fermented beers on aged stuff. Um, you know, for instance, what does oxidation mean in terms of barrel aged beers? You know, it's very easy for us to think of what it might mean when we're drinking an IPA, um, you know, usually diminished, sweetened, hop character, um, you know, that lack of freshness, but oxidation is a much more complex process when you're talking about barrel aging. Um, it can certainly mean, um, you know, an addition of a certain type of papery or cardboard note. Um, I mentioned, you know, we just put out that Pedro Jimenez sherry Belgian quad. Well, you know, sherry is a highly oxidized wine and it's definitely going to impart that note. That doesn't mean it's an off characteristic necessarily in that beer. It just needs to be in the right proportion, right? Um, oxidation can also lead to the production of acetic acid. If you've got retinamyces or acetobacter, um, you know, in your barrel, um, in that case, you know, oxidation can slip into, um, you know, developing vinegary off notes that you're not going to want in there. So, um, you know, that's a different kind of tack to that process that you might want to minimize. As I said, I do try to do a little bit of CO2 purging of the headspace of barrels when I'm getting in there and investigating them. Um, some oxidation is um, necessary and inevitable, but um, you also can find different ways to manage it in terms of the number of times you're opening a barrel or, like I said, attempting to purge out the headspace a little bit. Um, the fusel quality, the alcohol heat of the beer, right? Generally, we're talking 
you know, higher ABV beers, um, things that are going to require, um, you know, a bit more conditioning to smooth out the rough edges. But sometimes when you have, you know, a spirit aged beer, you want a little bit of, you know, heat and booziness to it. And it really kind of depends on, you know, what your um, envisioned profile is for the beer that you're producing and aging. Um, and of course, you know, you can also certainly get into your acetates, your more solvent and nail polish remover type of characteristics, almost always a negative. Um, but these are things that, you know, if you're noting them early on in the aging process that can diminish over time um, and you can let, um, you know, prolonged secondary um, aging really smooth out some of that beer before you're willing to call it ready. Um, so that's something to consider. Also, of course, we've got the, um, the wood characteristics that come into these beers, you know, principally oak. When we think about chemically what oak is and what it's exchanging um, with beer during the aging process, um, you know, we often talk about like vanilla, coconut, caramel. Yes, of course it's there. Chemically, it, it is vanillin. Vanillin as a compound is present there in oak. It's going to exchange into the beer. So that vanilla flavor you're getting, that truly is um, the, the same chemical as the vanilla bean. Um, coconut tends to emerge when you start to extract um, lipids and lactones from oak. Um, so that's going to be, um, it's gonna have a little bit more of an impact on the mouth feel um, while also imparting that. So perhaps a little bit of slickness, but usually not if it's in um, you know, a, a moderate um, amount. Um, development of diacetyls. Uh, which tend to give you your caramel and your um, toffee compounds. Again, something that we associate with like that buttered popcorn or real mouth slickness in, um, um, you know, hastily fermented beers and stainless. But over time, these are compounds that can develop in our um, barrel aged beer that will accentuate certain characteristics, um, especially with caramel and crystal malt that we're going to want in there. Um, and then, um, of course, tannins, which we heavily associate with wine, but um, almost always see some sort of tannin structure developing. Um, that tea-like, slightly puckering sensation on the back of your tongue when you're drinking those beers, um, you know, you can feel those kind of tannins coming into effect. And um, finally, um, lignins, which tend to um, give off toasty notes, but in too high concentrations, especially coming out of the deeply charred barrel, um, can verge into smoking, which um, from my perspective is, is not usually something that um, I'm looking to, to get out of a beer. If, if a barrel was starting to give off um, a, a more smoke-like note, I would probably um, want to phase it out or, or blend away from that characteristic. Um, of course, there's all the spirit and wine um, specific characteristics that these beers take on over time. As I said, select for the um, you know, first use spirit of wine that, that you want um, and know what those characteristics are gonna be, whether it's kind of bright and acidic and peachy like a Sauvignon Blanc or something, or you know, you're looking for um, you know, a more dessert-like kind of a spiced rum characteristic in, in those types of spirit barrels. Um, you know, consider the way that those are going to show up in, in your beers you know, when you're tasting them and how they're interacting you know, with the base style. Um, and of course, farmhouse and sour and wild beers um, have their own vocabulary. Um, vinous, right, wine-like beers, um, they tend to be very dry, um, but you're also layering different types of acids, acetic, malic, lactic acid, that um, provide different levels of sharpness and flavor. Um, malic in particular, I find to be, um, to to lend a kind of roundness and smoothness to acidity. Um, and it's, it's something that um, I was looking for in that oud brune that I described earlier. Um, and of course, straw, of course, blanket, pear and cider-like notes, um, not necessarily green apple, like your acetyl aldehyde, but um, um, you know, more of those kind of like acidic um, fruit notes. And um, even uh, to go so far as like leaf pile, if, you know, Britannomyces in oak um, will sometimes develop notes that are reminiscent to me, um, having grown up in upstate New York, of kind of a fall, you know, oak leaf pile, um, perhaps slightly dampened in the, in, the, in the most pleasant possible way. 
So, um, you know, these are all aspects of our, um, of our vocabulary that we need to develop when we start to um, age these beers, anticipate the direction that they're going to take, um, but also understand, you know, what is contributing um, a desirable or undesirable characteristic to uh, any age beer that we might be trying to release. Um, a little bit on training um, brewery staff in um, barrel cellar techniques. Um, you know, the cellar can really be an exciting area to bring employees in and get them um, familiar with some new pieces of equipment, um, some stuff that really, you know, kind of feels like that great hands-on, um, like real brew, brewing work that, that we all love. Um, but this goes beyond just working the cellar, right? Um, it, it encompasses packaging as well. Um, there's a lot of specialized procedures and sensory that we bring to, um, you know, putting out H beers as a team. Um, so as you're bringing people in and you're training them, um, you know, I, I urge you to consider the many distinct procedures throughout the aging process that need to be executed to cleanly and safely, you know, execute one of these beers. Think of, you know, the specific ways that you clean and sanitize in the cellar for these beers, the way that, you know, hydration and swelling of barrels works, um, coopering procedures, actually moving your barrels, um, you know, on racks, whether full or empty, um, simply, you know, getting comfortable moving those things around throughout your brewery space, um, you know, can be something that people actually do need a bit of experience and training on. Um, of course, filling, blending, um, when you're moving beer, whether into or out of barrels, as gently as possible, right? Everything's running at low pressures, Generally, we're all always operating around ambient temperatures um, and trying to be as um, careful and cautious and mindful of what we're doing with those beers, you know, at, at all times. So these are the things that, you know, really need to be emphasized when you're bringing um, another um, member of your brewery staff into the cellar for the first time. And they're just starting to see the way that, you know, some of these um, operations work often much more delicate than, you know, the, the type of work that we do in other parts of the brewery. Um, always emphasis, you know, cleanliness and care and handling barrels. You know, barrels themselves are pretty tough. Um, empty barrels can kind of be rolled around and whatever, but um, once you've got something aging in there, it's like stillness, quietness, lack of exposure to extremes of temperature or anything else. That's, you know, always what we're trying to emphasize. Um, and then when it comes to packaging procedures, right? Um, paneling, developing consensus of carb levels, carving at much lower levels than, you know, what our typical um, beers might be at. It's really rare that, you know, I'm going to um, ask for a, like a clean aged beer to be carved up beyond say like 2.25, 2.3 CO2 volumes, um, generally because I prefer the way that those beers taste in the barrel even better than I like them sort of, um, you know, out of the keg or bottle. Um, and so keeping the carb level low to me keeps it truer to that original style. But then there's certain beers like Saison's, which we've rolled out, you know, many of them over the years um, that really require a higher level, level of carb champagne-like numbers, you know, 2.8, 2.9 CO2 volumes. Um, to really be considered true to style. So, um, you know, I would encourage you all to check your, you know, BJCP guidelines for what, um, you know, appropriate spritziness is for various beers. Um, I was corrected um, by, um, you know, our head brewer at Motorworks when I tried to put on maybe like a 2.45 carb on viewed Brune. And I was told that, you know, really that one should, should exist closer to that Saison range brought it up and you know ultimately that was the right decision um so that's my overview of of um brewery training again we could revisit that if people want to ask more um sort of the the final section of um the the talk here has to do with opening up the cellar to um partners and collaborators and really finding ways to use the cellar as an asset that adds something to um, the entire brand of, of your brewery um, and the health of your barrel program financially. 
Um, we had the fortune at MotorWorks to um, be contacted by a few different companies that either um, wanted us to produce a barrel aged beer for them or whom uh, we had already been supplying with something and they wanted to venture into um, a different kind of product. So I'm, I'll talk for a few minutes um, about two, two of these different relationships. So Burn Steakhouse, as I already had mentioned, um, we put out a beer to guard for them, um, strong beer to guard, about 11% aged in those Eagle Rare barrels. But that was really part of a longer partnership. Um, we were the first um, brewery to do the Legacy series for them, which is an annual collaboration um, with a, a local kind of greater Tampa area brewery um, and had a, a ton of success with the Legacy 8 for them, which was a Belgian quad um, that was aged in um, a W.L. Weller barrel that Nate Wilson, the director of spirits, had provided to us. Um, that beer went on to um, win gold in the um, barrel aged Belgian dark uh, slash quad category. We were really, really pleased with that. Um, it sold, you know, exceptionally quickly um, because we were able to, um, you know, send them about half our inventory as you would in a, in a collab. Um, but we really saw this as a step in a process that became more than just a collaboration. It really became more of a partnership where, you know, on the heels of that legacy eight, Nate came back to me and said, hey, we'd love for you guys to do um, a barrel aged beer that's gonna be a house beer for Burns Steakhouse that's gonna stay on in perpetuity. And um, that was um, what kind of led to the beer to guard concept, um, something for um, a location that's really a high level spirit destination where I wanted to provide a beer that fit into a flavor profile that a serious um, whiskey or bourbon drinker um, would appreciate while not, you know, simply imitating whiskey. It's still, you know, something that's going to be, it, it, I'm not talking about like a 17, 20% ABV beer, still strong at 11%, um, but something that, you know, is going to be served in a snifter. It's going to have a little bit, bit of a spritz to it and just show off that barrel character. So that, that was a really, um, you know, kind of nice landing spot for that. And that also opened us up to um, providing them with different farmhouse beers and an upcoming um, yet to be completed series of beers for um, a high west single select uh, barrel lineup that they also provided to us. So sort of through that give and take, we were able to get um, aged beers in front of, um, to be honest, you know, an upscale clientele that wouldn't necessarily be the same people who were walking into our tap room in Bradenton. Um, it was a really nice way to get that beer out and sold to, you know, an audience that was going to appreciate it. Um, and the success of those projects fostered Burns coming back to us and asking us for, um, you know, other beers. And it, it's not contract brewing. We're co-branding, you know, getting equal billing on, on their, or we were getting equal billing on their menu. So it's, a, it's another way to sort of, you know, put yourself out there through a premium product. Um, and you know, find the right types of relationships to sell your beer, right? To basically know that you can put together um, a recipe for barrel aging that's effectively gonna be pre-sold going out the door. Um, and that certainly made you know, ownership and our sales director um, quite happy. And doing that kind of thing took the barrel aging program from being you know, sort of a clubhouse, like something that our brewers were doing for ourselves to something that we knew you know, had a home and, um, you know, an obligation to not necessarily meet a deadline because Burns was very flexible with us on that stuff, but to meet um, a certain level of expectation um, for delivering on quantity and delivering on quality. Um, the other example that I'll give for this um, was a partnership that we developed with the Streamsong Resort, um, which is about a, an hour east of Tampa, Northeast. Um, you know, a large sprawling golf resort, huge grounds, um, they had reached out to us and we developed an arrangement to produce um, a light lager for the golf course. And um, that was pretty successful. They came back and started asking about different beers and actually asked me about putting together um, an aged beer for their 10th um, anniversary of the resort. They had a set of barrels from their spirit program that they specifically wanted incorporated. Um, that they had done through um, streams uh, through um, Angel's Envy bourbon, 
Um, but one of them was actually a single select uh, Rhone Valley red wine barrel. Um, and the other was a, a, an ex bourbon barrel. And um, we had an exchange over email. And I was like, well, you know, I'd be interested in putting something together for you. You're asking me for a, a product. You want it delivered in about six months. You know, you want it to be this high end thing. It's very difficult to come up with um, a recipe, brew, age, package, um, and roll it out in six months of something that's going to be, you know, frankly, a, a, a world class aged beer, right? It's just probably not going to happen that fast. So perhaps we could do it next year. They, they were willing to come down and sample some stuff. However, that I said I had available in the cellar. I kind of provided a, a bunch of samples. And the, the very last thing that I pulled for them was um, off of two different casks of a different bourbon where I'd been aging our um, Daddle Imperial Chocolate Chili Porter um, for 18 months already. And it was a beer that I had not considered to be um, you know, particularly high character, was considering jumping it into a different barrel, but this is a chili porter, it's got some heat to it. And it's not something that I thought a golf resort would really be interested in. But I, we brought them down, they tasted some beers, that was the last one that I pulled. And as soon as they got their hands on that, they're like, that's the one that we want, let's do it. So jumped that into um, barrels, um, came out with a blend of that. It was a combined 18 month aging in um, bourbon, with another um, six months aging in the, the um, Angel's Envy red wine and bourbon barrels that they provided with us. Um, called it a two year aged um, Imperial Chocolate Chili Porter for their stream song, um, you know, Anniversary X um, golf event. And it ended up being a big success. We rolled it out in um, 750 milliliter amber um, bottles, cork and cage, really beautiful presentation. And they were able to effectively just use that as a party favor at a really high-end um, golf outing. And so that was one where, again, it's like we had a batch of beer, something that was aging. We were able to effectively pre-sell all of it. And then further our relationship with Streamsong, they continued to come back to us for um, the lager we were providing, added a hazy IPA to the mix. And they are now um, MotorWorks um, number one off-premise um, account. So um, that's an example sort of of how a small volume but high-end um, barrel project, you know, became something that furthered a relationship that drove sales and ultimately helped, you know, the barrel program kind of support itself and, and um, be seen as viable in the eyes of the brewery ownership. Um, I've got a couple of resources that I want to um, funnel you guys towards if you're interested in reading more. Um, this is, uh, you know, kind of where I'm going to wrap up and we can open it up to some questions um, for those of you who are still with me. Um, but um, I would really encourage you to check out um, these books, Wood and Beer, A Brewer's Guide. Um, that's Cantwell and Bucher. That's uh, from Brewer's publication in 2016. Um, Farmhouse Ales, Cultural and Craftsmanship in the Belgian Tradition by Phil Markowski. That's a 2004. And um, Michael Tonsmeer's um, American Sour Beer, uh, Sour Beers, which is really just a wonderful resource um, on some of these styles, both understanding, you know, different types of sour and farmhouse ales, but it's actually just got a lot of great kind of brewing advice in there too. So um, I'll, um, I'll refer you to that. Um, you know, I'll certainly open it up, up to questions. Um, sorry I didn't have my slides um, able to pop up to show you guys, but thanks for, for hanging with me um, on this. You know, it's been a, a pleasure to kind of put these um, ideas together and run, run through them for you. So thank you guys very thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mike. And then um, Mike, uh, somehow I will get the deck from Mike and I will make it available uh, on the forums. And like I said, yeah, we yeah. Will I'll, make this... I'll, send, I'll send you the slide. We'll figure out whatever formatting, but we'll yeah. make that available too. And, uh, and people, as... you know, you can also email me, you know, directly, any of you, um, Mike period BB, that's B-E-E-B-E -E -E, at firehousebrewing.com. Um, feel free to reach out um, at, at any time. I'm, I'm always happy to talk, um, you know, aging or, or just other um, brewing practice. So uh, does anybody have any questions they want to fire off at Mike? You can either just sort of, you know, sort of a uh, ring in or if you want to put it in the uh, in the chat. Oh, do we have some in the chat? Okay. Or if you just want to sit there and process all the things that you just yeah. heard and 
And then, I know. Uh, I just I just ran through a lot, and it's it, you know it's trying to cover a lot of territory in you know digestible chunks, but um, you know, yeah, I'm I'm certainly happy to go further on any any area of that if if we've got questions. All right. Well, we don't have any, but I think uh, probably okay. my guess is that people are gonna um, probably as they as they start doing stuff, we'll go, hmm, now, okay. uh, what about this? What, I mean, it's probably gonna be the kind of thing where you've got, um, oh, and- uh, Okay, yeah, we've got a comment. Comment, comment, from, comment from Amanda, it, is it overwhelming to start a new barrel program uh, with, with all your past experience? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, th thanks, Amanda. It's, um, I'd say it's more exciting at this point. Um, yeah, for, for those of you who are maybe not, um, Either, either if I was cutting out or you just missed the, the first part of the talk, um, coming to Firehouse now, a big part of the selling point, to be honest, for why I came up here, was the fact that I'm moving into a former winery space that's both designed to accommodate barrels, but that also gives me really extensive access to wine barrels um, in a variety of different styles. Um, and so, Overwhelming. I don't know. I haven't been able to do that much with it yet because they're still moving wine barrels out of my space. And I'm doing a lot of work right now to modernize what was like a 1980s type brew pub into a, a, a 21st century production brewery. So that's what I'm focused on right now. But um, I think that it is going to be um, really nice to claim some of that uh, wine cellar space for myself. Not overwhelmed by it, just looking forward to brew, brewing some of the styles, doing maybe a couple of saisons, um, you know, maybe a couple of porters for aging, and then really starting to experiment. What what I'm what I'm more curious about is the um, the differences in audience out here, um, particularly you know in a smaller, more remote market like Rapid City, South Dakota, um, the receptiveness to that kind of thing. But I'm encouraged by the fact that the winery has had some nice success and won some awards and, you know, um, you know, moves nice volume. Um, by the way, they, they truck the grapes in from the West Coast. These are not like South Dakota grapes, um, just the processing. <laughs> um, I, I think they, they experimented with that a little bit, but it didn't, it didn't, didn't really take. Um, so it's, it's mostly like um, uh, um, Washington State and Oregon, a little bit of Napa um, uh, uh, grapes. Anyway. Um, yeah, I'll get into that, roll it out, see what the response is. Uh, we had a kind of a nice welcoming event a couple of weeks back, and I floated the idea of, you know, wine barrel saisons to people. And they're like, oh, wow, yeah, I had a great one of those at such and such a place. I'd love to see more of that. So that was, that was encouraging. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Amanda. Also, I, um, I just want to, uh, we, we had a, a question from Josh about feeding sugar or honey in the barrel. So, um, I have not done, I have not done honey in the barrel. I've done, let's see, I mean, we've done honey in fermenters and stuff like that. Um, my, actually, so in the slides, I've got a good um, image of just like a basic barrel blow off system for re-fermenting anything. Um, I'm not going to make any claims about the particulars of the way that honey develops um, in, a, in a barrel aging scenario, because I haven't done it myself. But anytime you're adding enough sugar to re-ferment, make sure that you've got um, some single hole silicone blow off bungs with tubing that will fit tightly and simply make yourself a blow off line, you know, that's gonna allow that, that re-fermentation to happen. Um, my closest approximation of that would be adding um, like 20 pounds of whole blueberries to um, a, a non-farmhouse um, Saison. We did, we did something called Mertil. There's actually another barrel of it still sitting back, uh, back in Motorworks now, a, a second generation of it, where um, there was a lot of sugar re-fermented in a clean barrel. And it does you know, raise the possibility of making kind of a mess, but just managing blow off is the main thing. But unfortunately, I, no, I, I don't have any particulars about um, you know, the way that I perceive honey, um, developing characteristics. That's sort of all I can speak to on that. Um, let's see, we had one about examples of curated collapse for the golf course. Do I think there's a home for BA beers in the market? Well, yes, there are, but I would, so my perception of the, of the barrel age beer market 
is that there's a little bit of oversaturation now of your kind of traditional sort of high test, high body, you know, brown spirit beers. Um, a lot of the, you know, the heavyweight contenders are out there and they're fairly entrenched. Um, and it can be kind of hard to cut through that. Um, I think that, you know, finding different avenues, different styles, as I sort of tried to, you know, suggest, um, you know, designing beers that are going to move in, in different ways are, um, you know, barrel aged beers that might find their own little niche market. But it is tough to get distributors to take that stuff away. That's, that's, the, other, that's the other part of that game, right? Like, I talked about bringing in partners and showing them the seller and, you know, and that becomes a great experience for folks. You know, it's like you're opening up, you know, kind of the cave of wonders, right? Um, but we even tried doing that with, um, with, with distributors, with having um, like ownership or leadership from some of our most established distributors come down and do the same thing and, um, you know, see if they wanted to pick up, um, whether it was for in-house events or some other kind of occasion. And uh, while we got great feedback, um, it didn't ultimately move us any beer at all. So, you know, you have to be willing to sort of like try things with people, but you're not always going to get, you know, takers, um, takers for that stuff. So like finding one or two, um, you know, great partners, whether it's a retail outlet or a restaurant or um, a resort, whatever the case may be, um, who kind of wants you to continue to, to feed those beers to them is to me, you know, the surest way to find a home for some of those beers and everything else, honestly, is a little bit of a loss leader. Um, you know, I didn't even kind of finish the whole picture with stream song after we rolled out the anniversary beer, they opened a steakhouse. They wanted a series of farmhouse beers to occupy a draft line there. So we even set up a, a, a deal with them where, you know, every three to four months we could roll out, um, you know, a different keg of uh, um, a wine barrel farmhouse beer, you know, just in varying styles. Like we created a skew just for that. And that ended up being the, the um, highest out the door price of any um, six barrel keg that we ever sold. Just this recurring skew to the new steakhouse. So, you know, wow. finding, finding good partners for this stuff is really valuable, but pushing it out through sort of conventional distributor channels, I found is very challenging. So either that was a route that we sort of chose to pursue because we felt that our clientele in our tap room was not attracted enough to those styles. And we, but we still wanted to find a way to like give them a home. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I know we're, we're probably well past when most people had scheduled. But I know, I know. We kind of blew past it on time. But no, no, that, that's okay. Bit. It's, yeah. you know, I mean, we had, we had technical difficulties, so that's not, that's bit, okay. Yeah. That's, that's fine. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for sticking around. Um, and like I said, uh, I will post this uh, and make it available on our YouTube channel, um, as well as uh, Mike will send me his deck and then um, the, uh, the list of those books. So I'll, I'll make sure I include those in the post as well. Um, so you guys can, can check them out. Um, and yeah, Mike, thanks for, thanks for your time and your expertise. That was really, that was really interesting. A lot of stuff that I, I mean, I'm not a brewer, but a lot of stuff that I didn't know and it was really pretty, pretty cool. So. Yeah, no, th thank you so much for, um, you know, inviting me to do this again, you know, pleasure to, um, you know, reconnect with the, I haven't been away that long, but reconnect with the Florida brewing community a little bit and, uh, you know, kind of think through some of this stuff as I, uh, you know, get ready to start it all over again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. I'll, I'll get the slides and stuff out and we'll all be in touch. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Bye. Bye.